The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Summer music festivals are back. So to celebrate all this July, the Agenda in the Summer revisits conversations with a diverse cast of musicians and music experts. Tonight, Shazad Jiwani from 2016, my first year at TVO. It's been said that music is the universal language, one that can tell stories and challenge norms. And for just that reason, for many people, it matters whether a band is Canadian. Joining us now for a look at how well Canada's indie rock scene reflects and expresses Canada today, Shazad Juwani. He is the front man of Grace, one of Toronto's noisiest punk bands, and their latest album is called Outer Heaven. Welcome. Hi, how's it going? I'm good, I'm good, how are you? I'm great. I always have, like it's so weird when you put music in like a genre and call it this and call it that. Right. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think it's uh, a little bit difficult for the artist to be put in a box that way because mm -hmm. I think that when you're making music you don't really like think of it as one thing uh, and it's more of a journalistic thing to sort of classify you a certain way. Where do you think that comes from? I think it comes from the, uh, jo their job as, mm -hmm. as writers and, and journalists to kind of like communicate what exactly this thing is to people who might not have the language to uh, dissect it that way, which is fine, but it gets kind of out of hand when someone tells you what you are, and it's like, well, I don't, I don't identify that way yeah. musically, so it can be kind of annoying. But Yeah, I always feel weird like saying a band is X, because it's like, well, what if you don't think you're X? Yeah, totally. Right? Um, I want to set the table for our discussion by playing a clip from your first single, sure. No Star, from your latest album, Outer Heaven. Don't shoot You know, I get a sense of sadness hearing that song. Um, mm -hmm. What inspired you to write the song? Uh, the song was written after the attacks in Paris at the Bataclan Club. Uh, we were on tour in November of last year and we heard the news uh, as we were arriving to this club in Minneapolis that we were playing. Mm -hmm. And it was terrifying. You know, it was very, very jarring to hear that people, like some people that we were like friends of friends of ours, were at this club being attacked. Um, and it was just immediately, we, we were like silent and very, very afraid. I remember calling my mom, just asking her like, what is happening? Why is this happening? Um, and then beyond that, sort of people's responses to that, uh, both, you know, you had people burning down mosques in Ontario uh, and people being attacked on the subway in Toronto just for looking a certain way and then on the other side of things, you also had people sort of using that as a platform to sort of further their own agendas. And, and really, the people who it affected the most were the least uh, vocal about it. Or not the least vocal, but given the, like, not so much of a voice, I felt, mm -hmm. and uh, weren't part of the equation. And I thought that that was sort of unfair. And being a person of color, uh, it felt very uncomfortable to me. And uh, I didn't like being spoken for that way. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many other people feel that way as well. So the song was sort of like an aggravated response to that, of just being tired of somebody else speaking for me on either side of the equation. So that's where it came from. Did you find people treated you differently after that? Not me personally. Like I can only speak from my own personal experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been pretty fortunate uh, growing up in Toronto where uh, it's very ethnically diverse. Uh, the music community is extremely inclusive. So I don't think that people treated me differently, but it certainly became a topic of conversation, which admittedly, you know, when you choose a single that is about 
something as serious is that people are going to want to talk to you about it, which I fully take on board. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I feel like a lot of the message was kind of mi uh, missed. Well, um, what, what, what was missed? I think it was missed in terms of people wanted to talk about it because it was a talking point, not because they were genuinely curious about it. Like, it seemed like a lot of publications, certain publications, I guess, kind of, it's like a platform that they want to talk about because maybe it, it generates more traffic or something like that. So mm -hmm. it seemed it seemed sort of ironic in a way. Um, but also, it, it's it's something that needs to be talked about. So I think ultimately, if, if people are giving me, mm -hmm. and by extension, a group of marginalized people, a voice, then that's ultimately a good thing, I think. But what inspired you to write it? I mean... It was scary. Mm -hmm. It was scary to be in America, number one, uh, being a visible minority. Uh, and also, it was, it was something that I hope never happens again. You know, it happens on, in a rock club, which is a place that we consider home. We played in Paris there, like, the year before, like, down the street from that club. Our booking agent in Europe uh, had several friends there, mm -hmm. um, so it was very, it was a very uh, jarring thing, uh, and I. It was immediately very. Uh, I think a lot painful. of people, yeah, I think a lot of people have these, you know. I think we live in a country where we don't we're we're not subjected to a lot of things that other people face every day. Yeah. And then when something like that happens in a in a place that's very familiar to us because we go to music shows, mm -hmm. you're a musician. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe it gives you a different perspective that oh my God that could have been us. Yes, and th I think that's why I think that's why it was so powerful. And I feel a part of me feels really guilty because this kind of thing happens mm -hmm. in so many different countries all the time. But for a place, you know, like in Paris, especially after like the Charlie Hebdo mm -hmm. uh, attacks as well, um, part of me felt guilty for that being the reason that I started really paying close attention. But that is how it happens sometimes. When it happens closer to home, you're forced to pay more attention. Um, so by virtue of that, that's sort of the motivation for the song and why I kind of felt compelled to say something because at the end of the day, if you aren't addressing this, it's not just going to go away, I think. Do you think that music can affect political change? I think that a lot of people put a lot of uh, pressure on artists and musicians for being, for having like an answer or something like mm -hmm. that. Like people will look at guys like John Lennon as sort of like political speakers. And it's like, well, really, that's not the end of the conversation. That artists are the beginning of the conversation. They're the ones that should spark the initial inspiration to start looking into something more deeply. Mm -hmm. We're not experts. Like, I play guitar and yell things <laughs> into a microphone. Like, I'm not in any way like a political scientist. Like, I can only refract whatever I take in and, and, and uh, communicate that to people. So I think that I don't know if we can inspire political change, but we can inspire people to start thinking more politically and thinking a little bit more closely about the things that are important to each individual artist. I find, too, now in this, uh, the age of social media, I find sometimes that musicians, celebrities, are kind of pushed to take a stand on certain things. Yeah, yeah. big time. Do and you think I, you have a responsibility to do that? No, I don't think that anybody should have a responsibility to just say... I think that's part of the problem, is that people think that they need to comment on everything. And I don't think that that's the case at all. I think that people should comment on things that resonate with them, mm -hmm. good, positive, or negative. Um, but I think part of the problem is that it gets cluttered with people's opinions a lot, very easily on the internet with things like Twitter, which, which ultimately is, that's just the way people communicate mm -hmm. these days. But I don't think that artists have it. I, I think that in 2016, if you're not saying something about the world around you, especially as like a punk band or an indie rock band, then that's too bad, I mm -hmm. think, because there's a lot of things going on in the world that do need our attention more than being hung over and partying and whatnot. Um, but again, like to each their own, like you're not, you don't have any responsibility or again, too much pressure gets put on rock bands, I think, to communicate a message. And also too, from the perspective of uh, the person that you are, what you look like. Growing up, I grew up in London, Ontario. I liked Guns N' Roses and I liked Skid Row. Yeah. But then everyone had the assumption that, oh, you like hip hop, you like R&B. Right. Uh, when people find out or when they see you fronting an indie rock band, mm. what is that reaction like? I think people are often like uh, surprised that I'm the singer, which I get a lot, which is kind of funny. What do they me. expect you to be? I don't know. <laughs> 
I don't know. I guess a brown guy can't be an indie rock front man. But I don't know. I grew up worshiping like Stephen Malkmus and people like that. So those are my idols growing up. So obviously I want to kind of be like that as a, as a teenager getting into music. But yeah, it's kind of funny when people are like, oh, you're the guy that writes the songs. It seems like an interesting, uh, it's a weird thing to be surprised by in 2016. It is. Again, it goes back to, I guess, the genre, uh, needing, yeah. having that need to put people in boxes. Yeah, 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 I guess so. Yeah. I, I mean, it is a kind of a whitewashed genre, but I think more and more you see a lot more people. Jimi Hendrix, what? Yeah. There you okay. go. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, rock and roll was yeah. not invented by... Yeah, it's yeah. like created by black musicians. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it, But it's I, you do start to see a lot more people of all sorts of different backgrounds. You see a lot more, like, there's a lot of popular indie rock bands with really powerful female front women, um, people of color in all sorts of different bands. Mm -hmm. um, like our, our label, Buzz Records, has so many different people from so many different backgrounds, um, people who identify so many different ways, which mm -hmm. I think is starting to happen more and more all around uh, the indie, like the greater indie rock community, which I think is really wonderful. So. Being in Toronto, I mean, we, we were just recently named the most diverse place in the world. Yeah. Um, when you travel, especially the climate in the U.S. with the upcoming elections, how do fans respond to you? Do you have, do you, have you ever had any negative experiences? No, I've been pretty lucky. Mm -hmm. I've been pretty lucky with that kind of thing. Um, it's, if, if it's anything, it's very, like, subtle, kind of couched racism. But the thing is, like, within... The DIY, like punk rock, indie rock community, it's a lot of like minded DIYs, people. DIYs, do you do, do it yourself? yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's extremely inclusive a lot of the time. Like, there's obviously people who don't really understand how to navigate those things. And, um, you know, there's, there's mean people everywhere. But I think for the most part, we're really lucky that we're part of a greater circuit of bands and promoters and fans all around North America that are extremely inclusive and have never made me feel out of place or anything like that, so. We touched on it a little bit, but I wanted to talk more about your uh, early introductions into music. Sure. What's your earliest memory? Of like, just getting into like rock music? Yeah. Um, my earliest memory was to, one was watching Terminator 2 and seeing John Connor ride around <laughs> on a dirt bike listening to Guns N' Roses. Yeah. Uh, and then the other, my dad played me Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones once, and it was, it just, like, you know the Maxell guy who's just like, <laughs> yeah. so that, that was basically me as like a three-year-old kid, so. And you were hooked. That was it, yeah, mm -hmm. that was the end of it for me. And Getting, those are some of your favorite bands then, or? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, to this day, for sure. And then Nirvana, like, Nevermind came out when I was four years old, mm. so that was like pretty monumental oh to me. Oh my gosh, you're a baby. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You were four? Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> How did Grays get started? Uh, Grace started my, our guitar player Cam and I, we went to high school together. Mm -hmm. um, and we just, at the time, it was like the late 2000s, 2010, 2011, and we were kind of kicking around the idea of starting a band that sounded like the noisy punk bands that we liked. Like, like hot, who? Like Hot Snakes and Drive Like Jehu, um, Fugazi, and. Mm -hmm. Um, Failure and all these different bands like that, Jesus Lizard, and we weren't really hearing that in Toronto because at the time it was like a very, very like indie rock city. This is like post broken social scene who still have like a monumental impact on bands from here. Uh, so a lot of the bands that were around at the time were pretty like poppy mm -hmm. indie rock bands, which is fine, but that just kind of wasn't really what we were feeling at the time. And so we just decided to start this band that was like extremely noisy and angular because that's what we wanted to hear. And, and what is the noise? Like, why noise? I think there's a level of dissatisfaction that is quelled with extremely loud guitars for certain people. Like, mm -hmm. there's something very calming about just hearing and feeling these intense vibrations from the amplifier come at you. Mm -hmm. And it was somewhat therapeutic, I guess. Like, it, uh, it satisfied a lot of things for me. Uh, it feels like, it feels like you're, like, a member of the X-Men or something like that, and you have, like, a superpower when you can just make this extremely loud noise and everybody in the room has to pay attention to you because you're louder than them. And uh, that was kind of the initial goal, was just to be as noisy as possible. Tell and me about your first show. How did it go? 
It was good. Yeah. Actually. Were you nervous? Ki kind of. Yeah. Uh, we had all played in bands before, so it felt pretty natural. Um, I look at our first show as when our drummer Braden joined the band, mm -hmm. and uh, he immediately just clicked with everybody. And he was he was so relaxed that he was wearing sweatpants on stage. <laughs> Um, and it was fun. It went over really, really well. And Toronto's always been really supportive of us. Like the, one of the first shows we ever played was in uh, a garage in Chinatown mm -hmm. that would later kind of become the hub for our community of bands on Buzz Records and, and other bands too, mm -hmm. um, who to this day like are some of my best friends. And it was, it was a really good start for the band to be part of, immediately just be part of this really diverse and colorful community of cartoon characters. It was really Supergirls. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Super, yeah, it kind of was like that. Like you look yeah. at like Marvel comics and stuff like that. Like that's what the community of bands is like in Toronto to me. And yeah. I really love that. I think a lot of people think that because you make the music that you make, then you don't like certain music. And you just brought up pop. Um, <clears throat> do you like pop music? You just said I mean, you I love pop it. music. I mean, I grew up listening to all sorts of stuff. I got into rock music a little bit later because my brother loved hip hop music so mm -hmm. much. So I grew up listening to like Tribe Called Quest and Boot Camp and all those kinds of things, mm -hmm. but... Um, well, do you think yeah. that now rock music has kind of become a niche? Yes and no. I think, I mean, if you look at festival lineups, there's always going to be rock bands. Mm -hmm. Like, people always want to lose their minds to rock music. I think it's always going to be there. But I think, yeah, maybe it is a bit more of a niche because... Um, do you feel any pressure to popify your music? No. Make it more accessible, I guess? Which is so silly because it's music. It speaks to you. It speaks to you. Correct. I mean, we like melody, mm -hmm. but I never, I've never felt any pressure. I think maybe if we had like this sudden like groundswell of interest, there would be more pressure to perform a certain way. But mm -hmm. no, we've never. We kind of do the opposite. If somebody wants us to do something, we'll just do the mm -hmm. opposite thing. And you probably stand out even more, right? Maybe. <laughs> um, I want to show you a clip. This is from a program that we did last spring on the state of pop music. And Alan Cross from 102 The Edge is talking about authenticity in popular music today. OK. I wonder where the, the idea of authenticity is floating in popular culture right now. Is it important? I mean, back when we had grunge in the 90s, it was all about authenticity. Yeah. I mean, when you got up on stage, there was no set. You were in your street clothes, and you just played music as it came out of your heart. Mm -hmm. Now we've, we're living in a very, very pop world right now. I mean, you look yeah. at the top 10 uh, or top 40, and it's all pop songs. What do you think about what he just said? I kind of go back and forth on this. Like, I, I think that's true. It is all pop songs, but pop is kind of relative. Like, he's referencing the 90s and, and the grunge bands, but that was pop music back then. Like, Nirvana was a really, really popular band. And Pearl because Jam, they were popular. They were popular. They yeah. were pop music. Like, yeah. when, you, when you start to influence the way people dress, then you're a part of, like, culture. And, when, and, and you're a popular artist at that point. Like, Pearl Jam and Nirvana were extremely popular at that time. That's why those bands sold a lot of records. I don't think that it's altogether abnormal that pop bands are in the top 10 or whatever in the Billboard charts. Like, I think that that's actually quite normal. Uh, like, a lot of pop music was extremely lucrative in the 80s and every other decade as well. I don't think it's abnormal or anything like that, but I think the pendulum just kind of swings back and forth yeah. every I think if all music becomes popular at some point, I think and then so. it becomes pop music. Because yeah. I think right now you can hear a lot of rap music on the radio yeah. and you could say that's pop music. Totally is. Right? I consider a lot of, like, I mean, Drake to me is not like a hard hip hop artist. He's like a pop guy. He's one of the most p famous people in the world. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I agree in the sense that I do think that, yeah, a lot of pop music is on the Billboard charts right now, but I don't necessarily think that that's, like, good or bad. I just think that that's how it is right now. So I wonder why is there a pushback to become popular? Because do you get into music to make music for yourselves, or do you get into music to have a career, make, you know, tour, make money? So is being popular a bad thing? I don't, I mean... We don't shy away from having like a bigger audience or anything like that, but that shouldn't inform your creative decisions at all. Like we, <laughs> it's a it's weird for a band like us because we're pretty abrasive. But I would never think that abrasive in sound or message. Both. Yeah. I think that we can be pretty caustic in how we communicate that message musically and lyrically. But I don't think that we or really most of our friends and bands start bands with any notion of like 
it's some other notion of glory than like financial, I think. Like mm -hmm. for me, it was always enough to just be able to tour and play to an audience of people who paid attention to me. And if that audience grows, then that's great, but I'm not gonna stop doing it because it dwindles. Like I think every band has like an arc. Mm -hmm. And if you stop after it starts to go down, then that's too bad because you can continue making great art regardless of how many people are listening to you. So it's, ab it's absolutely not in any way a motivational thing for us to do better or whatever. Now going back to when you were three and you became a fan of rock music, looking back and looking at yourself now, do you like have an out of body experience? Like, oh my gosh, I'm actually making this music now. Oh man, if I was three years old and I saw myself now, it's like, oh, you get to eat pizza and hang out with your friends all day, no problem. That's great. I think three-year-old me would be pretty excited. <laughs> pretty excited. Is that what you do? Can I sign out? <laughs> oh, sure, yeah, that's essentially my whole life. But I mean, like, I also said, like, three-year-old me would have set the bar pretty low. <laughs> I'm flying over it, it's great. Well, congratulations on your success, hey, and thank you for, for being on the show. Thanks so much, thanks Appreciate for having it. me. Ontario has boreal and other forests like few places on earth. And this summer, if months of lockdown and social distancing isn't reason enough to visit them, our Northwestern Ontario Hub journalist, Charnel Anderson, has one more. It's something called forest bathing. She joins us now from Red Rock on the north shore of Lake Superior to explain. Hi, Charnel. Hi, Dan. All right, so from what I understand, there's no showers or bathtubs or nudity involved in forest bathing. What exactly is this concept? Yeah, no showers, no bathtubs, though it is, you know, a really adaptable practice. So I think clothing is really up to you. <laughs> um, so forest bathing, also known as forest therapy or Shinrin-yoku is, um, is really just about kind of going into nature and experiencing it mindfully. So like all mindfulness practices, um, the idea is to engage all five of your senses, you know, taste, touch, smell, sight hearing <laughs> i think that's all of them um and so you do this uh taking your time you know it's really a slow practice it's not like going into the forest and going on a hike um in fact you may not even walk very far but the idea is really just to be aware of your senses so you're kind of you know you're feeling the sun on your skin maybe the humidity in the air your feet on the earth that kind of thing um, and as I mentioned, so it's a flexible practice and you can do this with or without a guide. Um, and if you opt for a guide, they'll, they'll kind of help direct you and they may use what's called invitations. So those are uh, kind of verbal suggestions to help you connect into the situation. But as I said, you can also do it alone. Um, and you can really do it anywhere that there's some kind of greenery. So as the name suggests, a forest is a good place to do this. But you can also do it in a park. You can go out into your backyard, do it underneath a tree. Um, and you can even do it inside. So if you're sitting by a window that kind of overlooks um, a, a natural <laughs> green spot, um, you can even do it, you know, surrounded by house plants. And, you know, you may not get the same benefits as you would going out into the forest, but it's still a beneficial practice. So let's talk about the history. This isn't necessarily a fairly old concept, right? Yeah, no. So it's um, so forest bathing is uh, based on a Japanese practice called Shinrin Yoku. And so this practice was developed in Japan in the 1980s as kind of um, a preventative health care measure. And it actually went on to become part of Japan's national uh, health program. In fact, Shinrin Yoku as um, as a term was coined by the Japanese Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries in 1982. And since that time, there's been a lot of research done on the subject, which, which points to positive benefits, uh, both physiologically and psychologically. So perhaps it's no wonder that this kind of thing has caught on in the West. Now, obviously we're in a pandemic, a lot of people are going outside, but I understand there's actual science behind, you know, benefits to communing with trees, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's um, a plethora of research that's been done on the subject. Uh, so some research suggests that this practice of forest bathing can help lower cortisol, which is uh, the stress hormone that can lead to all kinds of things like high blood pressure and heart disease. Uh, research suggests that for forest bathing can improve your immune function. So I don't know if you know this, Jan, but um, trees emit what's called um, phytoncides, and it's essentially like tree essential oils. So when you cut into an onion, you get that strong onion smell. Those are phytoncides. Right. And so trees emit those as well. 
and they have an effect on immune system cells called natural killer cells. And so those fight viruses and cancer. Um, and so one study, um, in one study, the number and activity of those immune cells, the natural killers actually rose in people who spent um, three days and two nights in the forest. And those benefits actually lasted for over a month after they took that trip. Forest bathing also has uh, benefits, uh, mental health benefits. So there's therapeutic effects on um, anxiety and depression, ADHD, <clears throat> excuse me, ADHD even, um, you know, cause there's a mental relaxation component to this. Uh, there's also um, therapeutic effects on what researchers have called human feelings of awe. So those are feelings like gratitude and selflessness. Uh, forest bathing can kind of increase those. You had mentioned uh, guides off the top. Is there any benefits in, say, joining a, a guided practice or even a, a group? Yeah. So, I mean, the thing is, you know, anyone can go outside at any time, right? But if you're like me, um, sometimes I find it hard to make the time to do this and to commit to it, even though I know it'll make me feel better. So I think, you know, if you're like that, if you're like me, a guide would be beneficial to kind of take you through the process. And, you know, it also forces you to commit to it. Um, I think a, a guide would also be useful for people who uh, may not be familiar with, with forest therapy or mindfulness practices or someone who just may not be comfortable going out into the forest by themselves. Um, and so there are a number of different organizations that train and certify forest therapy guides. Uh, there's actually a Canadian organization called the Global Institute of Forest Therapy. And so they train guides all across Canada. But really, you know, there's guides all across Ontario. You can just Google it if you're uh, interested. Of course, we're still in a pandemic. Uh, why do you think it's you know, important to be outside and, and, and get exercise? Yeah, as you said, we're in a pandemic. And so what's interesting about this practice is that it was developed in the 1980s, right? And that's before, before the internet, before cell phones, before the pandemic, um, all these things that kind of keep us inside more. Um, and, you know, I think forest bathing, forest therapy is somewhat of an antidote to that. Um, it's really, I think the therapeutic part of it comes from allowing us to reconnect with the natural world that, you know, for mu much of humanity, humans spent most of our time outdoors. So um, it's nice to kind of go back to that and, and reconnect with nature. Some really great stuff. Thank you so much, Chanel. And that is tonight's agenda in the summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again next time. The agenda in the summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.